Good afternoon, Church for the Nations. How's everyone doing? You guys love God more than football, so thank you for being here. Let's see how it looks uh, two weeks from now. If you missed uh, Nancy Gastiel's podcast, she tells the story of how she gave up season tickets for the Chargers because she took God more seriously. So amazing stuff. So my name is Hike. It's so such a privilege to worship with you today. And we're going to talk about our, why we are transitioning this church from doing monthly communion to weekly communion. And today we're going to talk about the communion table itself. So this is a five-part series. And the first one, we talked about how it's important for us as Christians to be united on the essential doctrines, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the authority of scriptures, to be all in and radically united on those essential tenets of what makes us unique as Christians, but also to be flexible and chill out a bit on the theological disagreements, whether that be free will versus predestination, adult versus infant baptism, the elements themselves, what's happening in the sacraments as we discussed in great length last week. Uh, and regardless of the divides we have, we have to always ensure that we're Christ-like in our communication. Sometimes it's, better, it's more important on how you disagree than the disagreement itself. And last week, we talked about how there's different church traditions that don't welcome each other to their table. We talked about why there's major church splits. Uh, we talked about why a Catholic will not invite a Protestant for communion or an Orthodox who won't invite a Catholic and a Protestant to communion and how certain groups have certain restrictions when it comes to the communion table. We discussed that last week. You can view our sermons on YouTube and also our Facebook page. And today we're gonna to talk about the local. Two weeks, big picture. Now we're gonna talk on the local level. So we would like to call this not a stage, but an altar table. Communion has one aspect to it where it's an altar. It's making yourself right before God. I'm not the priest, but Jesus Christ is the high priest, and through faith in him and what he's accomplished for us, as the priest who offers himself as the sacrifice for ourselves, we could have a personal relationship with God. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, as we sang, it is only through Christ alone where we could receive the Holy Spirit, be adopted into God's family. It's through Jesus alone. And this is a reminder for us to make sure we're right before God, our confessions are up to date, that we are seeking God and receiving his presence. But there's also a table element to communion. It's not just a vertical relationship, but it's who we're sharing the meal with each day. And we're going to look through the letter to 1 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul actually says what makes this communion meal an unworthy event. And guess what? It has nothing to do with the theology we talked about last week. It has nothing to do with the traditions. It has everything to do with how we view one another, how we treat one another. If we don't love one another, we don't love God, as 1 John says. We're hypocrites. We're liars. We love God based on how well we love one another. This is a reminder not only to get right before God, getting our sin confessions up to date, but also to make sure that we don't have hatred in our hearts to the people right here. That's taking this communion in an unworthy manner. And again, I do believe the number one problem in the church is division. The Eucharist tastes bitter in a divided church, as George Lindbeck says. The biggest tragedy is when people who have Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who have the same Holy Spirit, who worship God, the maker of heaven and earth, can't sit down and participate in this sacrament called communion. So with that said, let's pray. And then we like to honor the scriptures here at Church for the Nations. If you could rise with me after my prayer and we'll read scripture. So let's pray first. Heavenly Father, I pray for your will to be done, your kingdom to come right now. Help us appreciate your body, the church. Help us break bread together and love each other as you love us. Help us first and foremost understand the importance of honoring this table 
It's a table that you have set for us. Lord, be with these words that are about to be proclaimed. Let them be more of you, less from me. And we pray for your will to be done as I'm going to open up another can of worms this week and get really personal. And there might be a lot of hurt that comes through this conversation through past experience. And we're not here to focus on the hurt, but we're here to focus on the healing, the healing that you alone could bring. So Lord, let this be a therapeutic sermon. Let it bring unity among your body. And we pray for it to be go forth and not come back void. So we pray this in your name. Amen. So if you could rise with me, I'm going to read the first slide. Uh, then we'll read the second slide together. I'll read the third slide by myself. And then if you could read the third, fourth slide together, we'll do a call and a response. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 to 34 uh, Paul is talking to a very immature church in Corinth that he established. They were very spiritually gifted and anointed, but they were really immature and they kept bickering and fighting. They lacked love. And Paul's saying, knock it off. And in this section, he's saying, what's deplorable is how you're taking the communion. So let's read. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worst. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Let's read together. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then and so, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's read together. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. But the other things, I will give directions when I come. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right. The last two uh, sermons were more uh, theological church history. Today's going to be more pastoral. And I'm going to open up with a great question. How many of you have been involved with the church split? Only, okay, everyone? Is this everyone? Everyone? Is that almost everyone? Okay, almost everyone, maybe a couple of liars, but almost everyone. Are you talking about the split? No, 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 I'm talking about in general, not the history of this church. It's painful, right? <laughs> Nothing is pleasant about it, it's awful. And it pains God's heart when this takes place. My first uh, ministry gig, I was a youth pastor actually at my home church. And it was an Armenian Presbyterian church. And we actually grew the church to have 50 kids every week. It was awesome. It was a really beautiful ministry. We had a great team of leaders. And the way we grew the church was uh, we were bringing people from the Armenian Orthodox background because 90 plus percent of Armenians come from the Armenian Apostolic background. And we grew the church. A lot of people gave their lives to Christ. People were really excited and happy to be together. However, there was a decision that was made to have two youth groups, literally splitting the youth group in half. One with the Protestant kids and the parents who didn't like the newcomers who were causing a ruckus, because when you bring new people, you bring chaos. 
and one with the Orthodox kids. And it went on for about like two months before I met with the Christian board and they said, this is unbiblical, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? They eventually reverted the decision, but the word got out into the community by then. And guess what? It got nasty. It got divisive and it was ugly. And it really wasn't, had, the, the sad thing, it had nothing to do with the kids. It was actually power plays, it was board decisions, miscommunication, not really caring about the people on the ground. What happened at the end of the day? Everyone was so offended. Everyone was so justifying their stance and their positions. There was stuff that wasn't public that was hard to justify some of the moves. It was a mess. But guess who was damaged the most? The kids. The kids. And what kind of church is not even thinking about that? That's the bigger issue. Till this day, when I see some of those kids, my heart breaks because I'm teaching, we love you, we love you, welcome, welcome. And then, all of a sudden, in the middle of that, they're, they're being, we're second-class citizens. Literally, we're separating you guys. It's kind of crazy to think about that this happened not too long ago. But this is the first and only major church split I've ever been a part of. Hopefully, it stays that way. But many of you know that when you deal with humans, you deal with churches, it gets messy, and it gets really divisive. So, let's talk about what leads to these divisions. What really is at the core of this honoring this meal? Now, local church divisions tend to rarely be about theological disputes. I would prefer it to be theological, so you could like rationally bracket yourself and just have an argument that's reasonable but you deal with foolish emotions. You deal with entitled people. You deal with ego trips and entitlement. And the love of Christ gets pushed to the side and Satan has a field day seeing Christians fight one another. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup in a, in, of the Lord in an unworthy manner is bringing condemnation on themselves. And Paul is saying, you're having people getting drunk and being gluttonous while the poor people are starving. The unworthy manner of the communion is a socioeconomic one where certain people in the church who are privileged are taking their liberty of being, this is my wine, I'm going to get drunk on it. This is my bread. Forget the second-class church Christians. That's what Paul is angry about, and rightfully so. Imagine if we would do something that awful. I remember a beautiful scene when we took communion. There was a multimillionaire and a homeless man taking communion together. That's what we're talking about. It's loving people who are different from you, yet we are common in the meal of the Lord, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's how we honor the, the body of Christ. Are we able to see each other as brother and sisters, not I am better than you, and put in I am better than you, insert your theological position, your cultural identity, your economic class, your looks, whatever it is, that attitude of I am better than you, this belongs to me, it's not for you, is at the root of the problem. This is true. You are who you eat with. Tell me the amount of meals you have with certain people, and I guarantee you these are the people who you're closest with. Families that eat together stay together. This is so true. If you're able to have meals, that shows me who is your family. The same is true with the church. A church that eats together, a church that breaks bread together, a church that lives life and does the one thing we have to do to survive is a church that stays together. It's really hard to get angry at someone when you're breaking bread together. And we need to make sure that we are a church that breaks bread together. Whether it's this meal every week or during the week, we have lunch, dinner, breakfast, brunch, a cup of coffee, whatever it is. That is an indicator of how healthy a church is. Does a lot of fellowship happen? Does a lot of relationships take place in the setting of a meal? And I love it. Now, I'm at the stage where my kids are starting to play with each other. 
It's beautiful to see them play. There's a delight as a father to see my two boys just run around, chase each other, and laugh. It's something beautiful when they're eating together, when they're having this joyful existence. And I know God feels the same way about us. When he sees us be joyful, loving, forgiving, compassionate, generous, kind, not judgmental, not condemning each other, I know he looks down and delights. In fact, the Holy Spirit will be present when he sees the children of God be obedient like that. And the Holy Spirit will disappear. And I tend to go into churches sometimes and I could feel the energy of the room, feel the spirit if it's there or not. And most of the time, the energy is pleasant when the fellowship is there. People are actually practicing what Jesus preaches. When I came to visit for the first time, I felt that love of the spirit here. I love preaching here. It's easy because people here actually love each other. It's amazing how radical that is. That simple acts of kindness, of being, hi, how are you? Does wonders, is countercultural, is revolutionary. Are we loving each other or not? And if we run into roadblocks, we need to forgive, remind ourselves that we are first loved, therefore we love. God loves us, therefore we should love others. We need to be forgiven, therefore we are forgiving people to other people who do wrong us. We're not, we're not condi- but we're not being repaying evil for evil, but repaying evil with kindness and goodness and forgiveness and gentleness, just as God has done that to us in Jesus Christ. Now, I talked about this last week, but Jesus is not a polygamist with his bride, the church. He doesn't have, you know, a super contemporary, crazy, charismatic bride out here and a super covered up Orthodox bride here and a no emotion, a reformed person bride here. He has one bride, one bride. It's not one ethnicity, multi-ethnic. It's not one generation, multi-generation. Jesus Christ knows who belongs to him. One bride. Also, God does not have grandchildren. God the Father does not have grandkids. You, regardless of how old you are or how young you are, you are a child of God. It's a direct link to the Father. It's not something you're traditional. It's personal. We worship one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when we accept Christ into our hearts, you receive the Spirit, and the Spirit helps you see the revelation of God, Jesus Christ, that he does love us, he has forgiven us, and his dad now becomes our dad, and we join this beautiful family called church. It's the same Holy Spirit that was present at the start of the church is here with us right now. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the desire of Jesus Christ is unity for us to be one as he is one with the Father. And we need to strive towards unity. But spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. The Apostle Paul says the flesh is the root of the vision in the church in Corinth. He opens up his letter talking about how some people are following him, other people are following Peter, other people say they follow Apollos. And he says, that's kind of ridiculous. None of us have died for you. And you think that's ridiculous, but think about most church splits revolve around leadership and personality types. Lutheran, who's that? Luther. Calvinist, who's that? Calvin. Roman Catholicism, the Pope. You insert local church disputes. Oh, I like this pastor more than this pastor. And they they kind of viewed pastors like trading cards. It's a weird thing when we prioritize the leader over the true leader of his church, Jesus Christ. Some of you may have been in this position. You talk to a Calvinist. Now, nothing against Calvinism. I'm actually okay with some tenets of it. You talk to a Calvinist, they quote Calvin more than they quote Jesus Christ. There's something wrong with your theology if you're quote doing that. I remember talking to a Calvinist once and I was quoting the institutes that Calvin wrote back to him and he's like, you actually read it? I'm like, yeah, you're the Calvinist here. Why aren't you know what's in your context? People do this all the time. And Paul is saying, what are you doing? If you have this favoritism, it's of the flesh. Let's read. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, 
Ouch. Paul's kind of mean in this letter. As infants in Christ, I fed you with milk, not solid food. You weren't ready for the, the, the good stuff. You weren't ready for steak. You're just giving you milk because you're still fleshly and immature. And even now you are not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of one flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere, being merely human? Think about this. The flesh is not just sensuality. It's jealousy, insecurity, strife. At the core of most church splits is some element of insecurity, jealousy, and strife. I was watching a YouTube video of, on Derek Prince, and he uh, talked about the flesh in these four categories using Galatians chapter five. The flesh is this word that is used in scriptures a lot. And sometimes we just think it's the first part, just sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery. And that's true. There is this element of sexual sin that also leads to division. And we're gonna go through that too if we look at the recent church splits. But it also has an element of idolatry, worshiping other gods and witchcraft. Witchcraft is just the spiritual term to manipulate spirits and control people. And there are churches that use spiritual language to manipulate people. And this is the important one here too. What's, what's works of the flesh? It's obvious according to Paul. It's not that obvious to me, but it's obvious according to Paul. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Yes. That is part of acting in the flesh. Having hatred, discord, fits of rage. It's acting like an animal. It's acting like, like you're not forgiven. It's acting like you have hate towards your brother versus love. So on one end, you have sexual immorality. On another end, you have control issues, spiritual control. On another, you have just immature temper tantrums of being insecure. And the fourth part, I would put it as addiction, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. You're being addicted to sin, addicted to a certain type of behavior. This is acting in the flesh, not walking in the spirit. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you're acting in the flesh when there's division. But when you're walking in the spirit, there's unity, there's love, there's peace, there's joy. There's the fruit of the spirit. So let's talk about why do church splits happen? One of the most disturbing books I read that didn't really offer a nice solution was a book by a pastor psychologist, Chuck DeGroat, and it's entitled, When Narcissism Comes to Church. And it talks about the epidemic we have in the American church culture, where for whatever reason, we kind of elevate the pastor and we think it's strong leadership, but it's actually narcissism. How many of you have been in a church where the pastor is a nut job, but is really charismatic and loving on the pulpit? And then behind closed doors, there's someone completely else. There's a lot of hurt here. This is an epidemic. You're not alone. Jesus hates this. I hate this. Pastors will be judged rightfully so more strictly because they are teaching the word of God. And it's usually the, 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 the holy, unholy trinity of the typical norms. It's usually some money scandal. It's usually some power trip or it's some sex scandal. Uh, just this on the ride over, some of you may know of IHOP, their founder of IHOP is now allegedly multiple track record of abuse. Uh, New York City, uh, Carl Lentz from Hillsong, the, it's, it's literally the, down the street from the church I served. The Lord told me as quickly as this mega church popped up, it's quickly gonna drop. And I'm like, no, that's just me being insecure because I had a small church. And the Lord is right, it disappeared just like that overnight because the pastor was having affairs. Another one, I hate to do this, but, but it's public. Ravi Zacharias. An atheist was talking about how this guy is actually corrupt. This is an apologetics. He's not some charismatic guy. He's an intellectual, articulate, uh, defender of uh, a Christian truth. But behind closed doors, 
he had a, a, a long list of, of victims. It breaks my heart because these are people that belong to God where religious people are abusing their power to manipulate and they act like the world. They're acting like the flesh. What should we do about that? I think we need to have better checks and balances on leadership. Follow the scriptures and look at the requirements of elders. It's all character-based, not talent-based. When I was getting my doctorate in ministry, uh, we had a course on every pastor in that uh, cohort, their biggest failure in the church, their biggest hurt in the church. And my partner was, is currently the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance of Canada, over 400 churches. And we talked back and forth. And what was the common denominator for a lot of church hurt? It was finding talent and being excited that they found talent, but they didn't cultivate character. They rushed the process. They had the speaking and anointing giftings, but they lacked the character to back it up. And what it often led to was they picked people based on talent, not character. And it always led to some sort of implosion, division, or church hurt. We had a big sample size to unpack there. All right, another big divisive issue in the church is uh, the Catholic priest pedophilia. pedophilia. Um, it's pretty bad. I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Spotlight. It's pretty awful epidemic. I remember, uh, sometimes I wear the collar. Um, I don't wear it so much here in California because you don't even wear suits here. It's like, I feel like I'm a little overdressed right now. Um, <laughs> but sometimes I'd wear the, the collar. Sometimes I'd go blue. Sometimes I'd go black. And one time I was walking in the streets of New York and I had my, my son who was like a, a year and a half at the time. And someone gave me a disgusting look for being a person who looked like a priest with a little kid. And I'm like, wow. Oh, but maybe there's hurt there. I don't know. Like, who am I to judge? But it's just the, the fact that this is so pervasive and it just took till relatively recently to expose it also indicates some of the toxic behaviors in the church. None of this is theological. This is just pure evil. And the statistics are staggering. Uh, uh, close to 4% of all active clergy in America were pedophiles, 4%. That's 4,392 that we know of. And it's more, usually more than one victim. In France, a recent report said that there were 300,000 300, children in France for the past seven years who were abused. That's the population of Glendale and Burbank combined. No wonder people were leaving the church. No wonder no one's taking it seriously because they didn't expose this sin for what it is and call it out. We have to be pure in our pursuit and we cannot tolerate the vision when there's sin in the church. All right, let's keep going. I'm going to defend every denomination by the end of this. Mainline Protestantism. This is the background I belong to. The mainline Protestant church has gone radically left in its interpretation of scripture. And the track record is this, the same story unfolds. Uh, the pastor or the denomination accepts homosexual marriage and uh, homosexual uh, leadership. Started with the UCC and the Episcopalians. Last month, it's, it's happening to the Methodist church, which is the largest mainline Protestant church. A mainline Protestant church is a denomination that has historic roots. And they're the denominations that built this country. Yet a lot of them have shrunk tremendously. And it usually starts with the acceptance of taking the passages of scripture when it deals with the purity of marriage. Because it not just only neglects that part, what usually happens is the whole concept of sin gets neglected. Being, uh, uh, talking about sin, destroying the division in the church, it, all this stuff gets ignored. And Christianity starts becoming a, a, a one-way mindset and there's nothing revolutionary to it because everything is love. God is love. That's it. There's no truth. There's no forgiveness. There's no sacrifice being talked about. There's no uh, reconciliation because of the G oh, Jesus Christ. There, there needs to be repentance and forgiveness of sins for there to be power in our proclamation. Otherwise, we're just patting ourselves on the back. And this has led to steep decline. You're going to have a lot of empty church buildings coming up right now and they already started. Uh, from 1970, uh, most mainline Protestants has been declining since 1950s. In 1970, mainline Protestant churches claimed most Protestants and over 30% of the population. 
That's pretty substantial. By 2009, it dropped to half. And the reason why that was high was because the Methodists. Now the Methodists have accepted it, and a quarter of Methodist congregations in the U.S. left the United Methodist Church last month. So numbers are going to even go down. Just important to talk about it. Uh, we, this has been probably the number one divisive issue of my generation. Uh, if, you're, if you were like, oh, yeah, you're manning me earlier, there, be careful too. There's a conservative version of this. American evangelical nationalism is on the rise. Billy Graham in 1981 warned the church about this. I don't want to see religious bigotry in any form. It would disturb me if there was a wedding between the religious fundamentalist and the political right. The hard right has no interest in religion except to manipulate it. I'm someone who worked in politics in D.C. And guess what? They don't care about Jesus Christ. They care about votes and having power. And we have to be careful not to fall into a trap and being a political ideology, being our savior. We have one savior. His name is Jesus Christ. And we want his kingdom to reign. We have to be careful because if we take the priority of Jesus Christ and substitute it with a secondary issue, a political platform, a theological uh, position that may be nuanced, uh, a certain individual who's charismatic and wonderful, if we substitute the supremacy of Christ, the lordship of Jesus Christ as head of the church with something else, it becomes idolatry and there's nothing to unite us anymore. Because I can't unite you guys. I can't do anything I, I really don't have anything to offer. All I'm doing is pointing you to Jesus Christ and saying he's the one who's going to unite us to God. He's the one who's going to unite us to each other. And if we do not understand that, we will deviate our path. We will attach on to something worldly, some political movement. It could be so many different things. And the church no longer becomes a church. It becomes something completely else. The table is our reminder that Jesus Christ is the boss and he's the one who brings us together. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep and step with the Spirit. We want to honor the Holy Spirit. We want to come to this table where the Spirit is present. How do we know the Holy Spirit's present? Is there gentleness in the atmosphere? Is there kindness? Is there self-control? Is there faithfulness? Is there forbearance, peace, joy? I mean, the scriptures talk about how the Holy Spirit is. This is who the Holy Spirit is because this is who God is. And when we come to this table, it should be a joyful occasion. We should have no hatred in our hearts, no animosity towards people who may disagree with us, but we're coming knowing that we are first and loved by God, Therefore, we need to remind ourselves to love each other. The story of Cain and Abel is the beginning of division in human history. Cain gets jealous. He's insecure about his brother's worship because God approves Abel's worship. But Cain gets jealous. God gives him a warning, knock it off. But he still continues and eventually kills his own brother. Think about how many Cain and Abel stories have unleashed itself in the church throughout the past 2,000 years. Brothers and sisters who are supposed to worship God are not worshiping God, but they're killing each other with their words, with their accusations, with their viciousness. But we are not marked by Cain. We're marked by Christ and the Holy Spirit. When we accept Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead us down to all paths of truth. The Holy Spirit will convict us of our sins, confess it. The Holy Spirit will tell us if we need to forgive someone. The Holy Spirit is our guide, our helper, our advocate. And if we don't allow room for the Holy Spirit, we will not be able to unite behind Christ. The key is to cultivate an atmosphere where the Spirit can only do what the Holy Spirit can do, is create this multi-generational, multi-ethnic community because it's not going to be based on who I am or the worship or the theology or the personalities, but it's going to be based on Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the head of his church. We get to all play our parts. We have a role. And only through Christ, through his Holy Spirit, can all of us not view each other as the other, but as brother and sister. 
there's usually an emphasis when we take communion on confessing personal sins. And that's a huge part of it. That's the altar piece, right? Uh, it's a reminder for us to make sure if there's unrepentant sin in our hearts, to make sure that we confess it before we take this communion. But if we look at what Paul is saying, we also have to make sure there's no animosity between one another. And how do we prevent animosity, works of the flesh to, to just take over ourselves? It's when we're unable to forgive each other. A family that's able to forgive one another will stay together. So I want us, when we take this communion meal, not only to be up to date with our confessions, but also to be up to date with our forgiveness. Who do you need to forgive? Is there someone right now that you haven't chose to forgive yet? If so, you may be taking this in an unworthy manner. You're definitely taking it in an unworthy manner if the person sitting next to you, you have beef with them, and you don't want to talk it out, you don't want to get some mediation, you don't want to just expose what may be troubling the relationship. If we do not take the teachings of Father, forgive us as you've forgiven us, help us forgive as you've forgiven us, we're in trouble. Because when we confess sin, when we forgive sin, that allows the Holy Spirit to take over. It really does. I've seen it time and time again. But whenever there's that sin that gets in the way of the Spirit, unconfessed sin, unforgiveness, it just breeds ground for division. But this is our reminder each week to make sure that we don't even let the Satan have a foothold in this church. Because Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of your sins. And Jesus commands me to forgive because he loves me so much. I don't know about you, but I love this expression. I think it's 100% true. You are what you eat. You are. If you eat only vegetables, you're called a vegetarian. If you eat only meat, you're called a carnivore. Your food intake is a marker of identity. Think about it. If you're uh, Italian, you eat pasta, pizza, espresso. <laughs> if you're Thai, I'm not thinking about elephants and tropical beaches. I'm thinking about the fusion of Indian and Chinese food and this wonderful palate called Thai food. If you're Armenian, it's kebab, right? <laughs> Everything we eat is meat. We're carnivores. Tacos, I love the tacos here. Beautiful. It's a beautiful food here, tacos. It's a marker of your cultural identity. Now, if you would say, what's the main marker of a Christian? It's the bread and the wine. This is our marker that gives us an identity. That this meal is a meal that reminds us that we are forgiven in Christ, therefore we need to forgive other people. We are loved by God, therefore we need to love one another. We actually honor the love of God whether or not we love each other. And we can't let the vision even have room here. If you let sin, just a little bit of it, it's like a yeast. It'll, it'll, it'll just take over. But if we step it out, if we crush it out through the blood of Christ, it'll cultivate its atmosphere that we continue to grow where people know that God loves them and they need to be forgiven by him. And we need to forgive people who've hurt us. So who do you need to forgive? We're going to pray right now as I bring the, the band up. I'm going to ask God the Holy Spirit right now to put someone to mind who may have hurt you and wronged you. And I want you to choose, it's your choice, you don't have to do it, but it's your choice to publicly say, I choose to forgive this person. If the Lord brings up someone to you that you don't understand why, ask God, why is this person being brought to light? The more specific you are with the hurt, with the sin they may have caused you, the more freedom and more love you will receive. So let's pray this prayer. Who do I need to forgive, Lord? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, part of taking this communion in an honorable way is to make sure there's no flesh in us, no uh, animosity towards other people, especially if that animosity exists with someone in this room. So Lord, help us crucify the flesh by trusting in the power of the cross. 
that forgives us of sins. We are forgiven because of this cross. Therefore, we need to forgive others because you tell us it's a command. So Holy Spirit, I ask you right now, if there's anyone that we need to forgive, help us begin that forgiving process right now by choosing to forgive them. Let us forgive. The Lord invites us to his table. If you feel like you would like to participate in this meal, welcome. The Lord invites you. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks to his Father in heaven, he broke it and said, this is my body given to you. Whenever you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and said, this is the blood shed for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever we take any, whenever we take and drink, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he returns.